Good afternoon, everybody. I want to welcome you to the first Parkside Chats of 2021 with the Balboa Park Conservancy. I'm Sarah Beckman. I'm your host tonight and the Director of External Relations. And I am so pleased to welcome special guests, dear friends of mine in the conservancies from New York. We have Mara Laut, the Executive Director for the Institute for Urban Parks for the Central Park Conservancy. And we have our colleague, Chris Kuzno, Director of Program Administration at the Institute for Urban Parks at the Central Park Conservancy. Mara and Chris, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's great to see you. I love the opportunity that this format allows us to have a bi-coastal event and have so many attendees. Um, I really appreciate you for being here with us tonight and thank all of you for joining us. Um, we are recording this session via webinar and we will provide it later for you and for other guests who weren't able to make it tonight um, to have this panel discussion. So we're here tonight talking about public-private park partnerships. And just for a little background, um, we, the Conservancy applied for a grant to, and a place within this partnerships lab that was in its first inception um, now close to a year and a half ago um, is when we actually did the work um, with the Central Park Conservancy. And it's been a really incredible process for us as an organization. Um, their help has been present in multi layers. And we'll talk about that as we go through, but this is a really great opportunity to sort of um, bookend the work that they've done with us and really segue to the future um, outcomes of all that investment um, and the work we've done internally as an organization moving forward. So welcome Mara and Chris. I would love to have you both begin just by sharing some background on the Partnerships Lab and how it came to be. Yes, absolutely. First of all, uh, Sarah, thank you for inviting us. This is such a pleasure. Um, our whole uh, experience with you in the lab has been just wonderful. And we're really delighted to be here tonight to talk about that and share a little bit more about what we did with your um, stakeholders and constituents. Um, the Partnerships Lab is actually a fairly new program for the Institute. Um, and for those who don't know, the Institute is um, a part of the Central Park Conservancy, which is um, certainly one of the oldest and uh, certainly one of the oldest, perhaps not the oldest, but one of the best known public private park partnerships in the country. Um, and the Institute was created um, to really um, initially find a place for all of the requests from other groups that were coming in uh, to um, figure out how you did it, you know, all the questions, when did you start? Who did you get involved with? What was the first step? What was the sixth step? And the Institute really was more about formalizing that work so that we could um, have a greater impact and reach more uh, other partnerships. Um, and we've grown over the last, um, Chris, what is it, six years now, 2014? Uh, yeah, the Institute was founded in 2013. And I think I joined I joined you in 2014 and yeah, six years. That's my daughter's dinner arriving. And I apologize for that noise that you now all get to hear. Um, but a lot of the work that uh, the Institute now does um, is designed to better meet those needs of those people who reach out to us with requests in the lab you know, a group would reach out, they would come to visit, you know, maybe we'd spend a couple hours with them, give them a tour of the park, maybe there'd be some, you're the best, uh, a, you know, a follow up uh, exchange. But we really wanted to go deeper, to have the opportunity to really work over a longer period of time with a group and help them um, meet a specific objective. And, th and that's how the lab was born. Um, and this was our first year. So uh, your conservancy was part of our very first, our inaugural cohort. Um, you know, we've learned a lot this year. Uh, I hope you all have learned a lot this year. Chris, is there anything you would add to the to the creation story of the lab? Um, yeah, just that it was it was out of it, it sprung out of those uh, informal conversations that you know we we would get hundreds of requests from park nonprofits, agencies, governments from around the country, big and small. Um, most often specifically talking about this nature of partnerships 
and how Central Park Conservancy's partnerships work and how what types of partnerships are out there. Um, and, and so it, it, it really sprung from that initial uh, germ of those types of conversations. One thing that I noticed when we came to visit you and met with other um, park entities or private partners is that there were common threads and that each individual organization did have a really unique story and kind of challenge they brought to the table. But what did you find to be, you know, a common thread or a singular issue that you could sort of rally around um, for all of us to work on? Yeah, um, I would say there's like a couple of different components to that answer. And as, as silly and trite as it might sound, the thread that really did connect all five groups that were in the first cohort was this idea of partnership. But for each group, it really manifested itself in a different way. So your conservancy was really looking at how to sort of reignite these conversations with the city and bring together all the various stakeholders that are a part of Balboa Park. We worked with the um, Forest Park Conservancy in Portland, Oregon, who was really looking how, uh, at ways to better um, partner with the park using communities um, and create effective partnerships that really reflected the diversity of their users. The city of Baltimore was really just, um, the nonprofit there was really just interested in understanding partnerships. So, you know, what is the sort of panoply of options and can we use this process of discovery to bring our own city uh, partner to the table so that we can sort of go through this process together. Um, and then the other piece I would say is, is more a characteristic of the groups that were successful, which is um, the sort of drive and curiosity and willingness to come to the table and really engage with us in this, you know, it's a big commitment. You know, this is the better part of a year. We're checking in all the time. We're constantly sending you emails. Um, so we really observe this sort of um, desire to and ability to commit to the work of the lab as well. I apologize if you can hear my daughter singing in the background. It's all good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and one of the things just moving into to get more specific about what our partnership entailed, you know, we did come to you with a request to help us strengthen our relationship um, with the city. And the results of that was way more than a prescriptive plan, you know, or a, a checklist of, of items. You invested a lot of time in strengthening our infrastructure. Um, and you did that in a really rich variety of ways. Can you talk a little bit more about that um, and your strategy behind that? Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you for asking that question. Um, you know, as I was saying, when we first had the idea for the lab, we knew it was, a, you know, not just about taking a longer time to think about how to do a specific thing, but really investing in the organizations that were applying to the program, who were successfully um, admitted to the program, um, and leaving them, I don't mean this to sound as um, condescending as I'm afraid it might, but we wanted to leave you better than we found you, so that you not only had a great plan of action for this idea that you were working on, but you had um, a better ability to work together as a team. Um, you know, we do a lot of team development work, as you know, with all the partners who are in the lab. And that's for two reasons, um, the two most important reasons. One is making sure that you are in the best possible shape you can be to execute once the experience of the lab ends. But secondarily, we're investing in the broader community of, of public-private park partnerships. So by investing in you and your infrastructure, we invest in the infrastructure and the capabilities of the field at large. And that's really important to us as well. Chris, would you add anything? Uh, what I would add, um... And, and Sarah, I think you got to experience this a little bit at the urban park, the leadership retreat that we had to kick off the program is one thing we invest deeply in at the Institute is we, we want to create a learning space for individuals um, to explore ideas. We're, we're not in the business necessarily of exporting them. Um, I, I think 
I like to think about, I heard this phrase recently um, describing learning um, as both looking out a window. Um, and what's interesting about a window is it offers you an opportunity to see a new perspective and a window also is a reflective surface. So we work to create both opportunities for people, uh, individuals to look at us as well as to look at themselves. And if I could actually just thank you, Chris, that reminded me of, of something else. You know, one of the things we've realized in our work with the Institute over the years is that um, every park is hyper local and, and every conservancy or friends of group or partnership that um, is created to support a park is really like no other partnership. It's a reflection of the community that surrounds the park, the users in the park, the, the political and fiscal climate at the time of the founding of the partnership. And our conservancy is a great example of that. You know, and sometimes we would have groups that came to us and said, can we just have a copy of your contract and we'll just go over there, replace all and good to go. But it's really the process and the partnerships, the trust and the relationships. And that all takes time. You know, we didn't sign our first contract with the city of New York until 1998, which was 18 years after our conservancy was uh, founded. And I'm not saying it has to take 18 years, but simply to say it takes time and the, and the, the conditions and the constraints and the opportunities are, are always different. And so that idea of exploration becomes really important because you want to understand what all of those are. That's going to set you up to create the best possible partnership that you can. I think for us, that message really resonated. And that's how you set the tone for our work together with the cohort um, that you're not here to export ideas. We're here to explore ideas. And it did shed light on all the different um, arrangements that private partners are building with their municipal partners across the country. Um, that really meant a lot. And I think sort of released sort of the pressure to achieve the level of, you know, all that the Central Park Conservancy has achieved, which in some cases is truly aspirational and in other cases is instructional. And I think that you are really practical and humble in your approach with us to say, this was tried and it didn't work or this works really well here, but we know it's not working in other you know, cities and parks and experiences. So I think that self-awareness, you know, helped us be more curious and ask more questions. And I think develop this network. And so I, that's another, I think that's an undervalued part of the partnership in some ways is that we've now created this really rich network um, of partners across the country that we can kind of tap um, for their experience and just kind of use as a sounding board or a resource as we move along, whether it's creating a partnership with a municipal partner, whether it's having um, best practices for placemaking during COVID. Like, you know, I, I really wanna to speak to that piece of it has been really informative for us and a great resource. Um, the other part that I'm not sure many know about is that you worked with our team um, Mara, you're a trained in the Clifton Strengths Finder. Yep. Um, and so we had actually some team building with your facilitation. And um, I know that was out of the norm format because you were supposed to come out here and do that with us as well as the other work together, but we had to kind of do it virtual. And then that was a really impactful part of, um, for our team during you know, those early days, we did it probably what in August. So like four months after we'd all been kind of separated and gone through some transitions. Um, that was really useful too. I mean, I think that looking at how a team works through transition um, with each other, that was kind of a, a hidden gem of the partnership that I want to call out and thank you for, because I think we've, I tell people, I'm like, we've really maximized <laughs> your offerings and taking advantage of pretty much everything you've put on the table as a resource for us. Um, that was really useful. I'm so glad to hear it. I, I mean, that work for me is so meaningful and so rewarding and working with your team was amazing. You know, I, this wasn't necessarily true of anyone in the lab this year, but sometimes people don't come to the table sort of open-minded and uh, open-hearted about that work. And in some ways that's the whole point because that is what 
really allows the team to understand one another and figure out all the right ways to lean on and support each other with all the, you know, all the work that you have to do ahead of you. So I, I'm delighted to hear it was, it was um, a good experience for you all as well. Yeah, so valuable. Um, so moving, moving to sort of the meat of what our partnership brought us together and we had done a lot of work behind this, um, your team has presented us with um, some recommendations, a draft report that just our senior leadership team has reviewed. So it hasn't even been shared with the board yet, but I'd love to just sort of look at the approach that you all took to that set of recommendations, um, what went into it. Um, of course, once the leadership and board have had a chance to review it and you know, in partnership with um, our colleagues at the Friends, there'll be more to that, but at least tell us a little bit more about how you went about those recommendations um, for our organization. Sure, Sarah. Um, so we, you know, we, we started off with uh, a series of conversations with senior leadership team at Balboa Park Conservancy. Uh, that also included several uh, key board members uh, in, in the conversations. Um, we did uh, a needs assessment, uh, a questionnaire to just test assumptions and further refine our understanding of uh, the situation in Balboa Park. Um, and then we conducted, you know, research. We looked at uh, benchmark research, comparable uh, cities, both in terms of population size, uh, uh, as well as uh, cities that have similar sized parks in terms of acreage, um, as well as reuse parks. So parks that were former World's Fair destinations or and also parks that had multiple amenities beyond just um, say landscape infrastructure or horticulture. Um, and so we did, we did a series of uh, benchmark research interviews with the, the organizations and agencies that manage those parks. Um, and then went beyond that and interviewed uh, a series of key kind of critical stakeholders in the Balboa Park community uh, to develop these recommendations. And then looked at broader trends in urban parks and specifically public private partnerships in parks throughout the country. I think that benchmarking is a really interesting part of looking at Balboa Park and we're so unique that there really isn't like one exact parallel park to compare us to. And so it is kind of looking collectively at bits and pieces of what other parks are doing and have found success in, in order to build our unique um, model moving forward. That's, that's I, another, I think, important takeaway. I, I, Sarah, I wholeheartedly agree with you. And, and I think like what's interesting when the, the parks that we looked at, each one operates differently. Each one is managed differently. I, um, some have multiple agencies working mm -hmm. in them at the same time. Um, and, that, and that to me is the lesson that I, I think is always that I strive to when when I meet with park groups is that it's not always it's it, it's a complex model because parks are complex um, and they often sit at this kind of Venn diagram of civic life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the and sort of in this industry, it's the four P's, right? It's the private, public park or public private park partnerships, and so. Maybe you guys can talk a little bit more just about that, but that there is, we're all sort of in this unique situation, but the true, the common denominator for, for all of these different places is that 4P, um, a version of that, am I right? Yeah, yes, for this, for this um, critically important facet of the kind of the broader world of, of urban parks and urban park management. Um, you know, it's, there is some organization that was founded in Queens a few years before our conservancy was that didn't last as long as our conservancy, but the, the idea of this model being applied to an urban park really started with our conservancy in 1980. 
and it wasn't long. Prospect Park Alliance was founded just a few years after that. The Battery Conservancy in New York and, and others started to appear in other parts of the country. Um, you know, and I think it's safe to generalize, although there may be exceptions in some parts of the country that th this is because there, there has been a true divestment of public resources in, um, in public parks. Um, you know, some interesting research that the National Recreation and Park Association published earlier this year um, between uh, 2003, you know, parks were actually doing fairly well and municipal budgets for parks were actually slowly rising. Um, as we came up to the point of the Great Recession, that all changed um, and parks budgets were dramatically cut. The only general categories of, of um, public services that received more significant cuts were libraries and corrections. Um, and after the Great Recession, most public services recovered. Parks was the very last, and it had just gotten to that point of recovering when the pandemic hit. And, you know, NRPA did a survey of 300 agencies earlier last year, 50% of them in April of last year had already been asked to make cuts to their budgets somewhere between 10 and 20% and those cuts just keep coming. So these partnerships could not be more important. You know, they have been all along. There's over 200 of them now. I think it's 226 that the Trust for Public Land has tracked, generating significant amounts of money. Um, and I just think their importance is only going to grow um, because you know, this particular economic crisis is like nothing we've really seen before. Um, and these partnerships, your partnership, our partnership are really poised um, to make an enormous difference to an asset that has been the backbone of so many communities making it through this last year. Yeah. That's average, I mean, San Diego, we, we rely heavily on tourism mm -hmm. for our, you know, City yep. budget, and that's a dramatic, dramatic impact. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, we know what's coming up um, and we know how critically important it is and to be able to learn from other organizations, um, you know, and work together is critical. So this, the timing couldn't have been better and we didn't know it at the time really, but um, it felt right. So we're still really grateful for that. I know we have a lot of questions already and I'm sure more will come up. Um, I'm gonna address a few, First one from Paul Meyer, because um, this is an easy one. Paul, when we are talking about investing in infrastructure, we're talking about staff capacity and expertise, um, our ability to navigate um, urban park management and leadership. And so that was done through the urban parks leadership retreat that the Conservancy put on and hosted in New York. And then also the work they did with us as a staff um, really to maximize our own strengths and skills in and through the lens of our specific um, challenge or mission for the project together. So um, that's how we invested in our infrastructure in that way. Um, I will go maybe a little bit backwards on this, but Gonzalo has a question. Um, in reference to the 18 years of work before a formal partnership with the city was created, was that intentional or did it take that number of years to establish your credentials or was it other factors? So a little bit more on that. Great question. Um, uh, a little bit, that it was not intentional. Um, but I would also say that because our partnership was among the first of its kind, there was no, um, there really wasn't a roadmap for, for how this kind of thing was all going to play out. Um, and the, the sort of point at which it became, so yeah, let me just say, yes, a lot of that was about sort of establishing the model. Yes, this can work. No, we're not going anywhere. We can restore an asset and we can take care of that asset and we can slowly, you know, we were slowly sort of touching all of the different parts of the park um, and really building trust. I mean, this is gets back to what you said with the four Ps, right? Like building the trust of the city in us, building the trust of the park using public in us, building the trust of our donors that their contributions would be well stewarded and sustained. Um, you know, and all of that sort of leads up to the partnership. And this formal articulation of the partnership came around the time that we uh, renovated the Great Lawn, for which we got a 
17 million dollar gift chris correct, I, correct. yeah yep. which was at, at that time the biggest gift ever given to a public park um and our board of trustees said you know it's time that we formalize this there's so much money that we have invested we really you know like this is the right time to come to the table and really sort out the particulars of what this partnership means yeah that's great um and Gonzalo or others, if there are other questions or add-ons to that, feel free to ask them. Um, Kathy asked, what challenges did you see for Balboa Park that were similar to the challenges Central Park was able to overcome? Mm, that's a good question too. Yeah. Where do we align? Mm. Were you gonna say something, Chris? I, I was oh. just thinking, you know, um, we, are, we are both flagship parks for our cities mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I think many, many voices lo love our, love Central Park. And, and I, I, I know from talking to you all, many, many people love Balboa Park and many people also have a whole host of opinions about what Central Park should be or who it's for. Um, and so I think that's a challenge that we've faced time and time again. Um, I always think back to an early moment in the conservancy's time. This is before we signed our agreement when we started doing initial work, restoring an area known as the Ramble, um, which is uh, one of the, the four natural areas in the park. And we were removing a, a, a number of invasive trees in the park, um, things like Norway maples. And, and as through like the period of time when the park the maintenance was, was deferred and, and la there was a lack of care, this enormous kind of wild tree canopy grew up and the spot became this huge birding community. While we were doing the, we at the time thought we were doing the right thing, stewarding the um, landscape, returning it to the original design. Um, we, we did not interact with the birding community and there was this big outcry. That led to the forming of a thing called the Woodlands Working Group, which uh, is a, a group that still exists today uh, and uh, members of the public belong to it. Um, and it's been a good, you know, it was a good learning experience, I think, for the Conservancy early on. You know, that segues a little bit to Rich Brenner and Ron Oliver's questions about bringing um, yeah. disparate but passionate groups together. Um, I don't know if you want to expand on that specifically based on their questions. Yeah, I saw that question. I thought the same thing. That's a beautiful segue. Um, so I, I'll just give a little, Chris, you know this history better than I do, so please jump in and correct me. Um, at the time that our conservancy was formed, there were two separate community groups that had been created to, to save the park. The Central Park Task Force, which was founded by the, ultimately the conservancy's first president, Betsy Barlow Rogers, uh, and the Central Park Community Fund, which, um, was a, an organization formed by Dick Gilder and George Soros, who are so totally diametrically opposed as a sort of political and economic sensibilities, but but just loved the park. Um, those were the two main ones. So it was the city's conversations with those two groups that resulted in the creation of our conservancy. But as Chris was saying, there were lots of other stakeholder groups that ended up you know, some of the some of the engagement with those groups and the integration of their priorities was a little bumpy, like the one Chris just described, and some of them were less so. Um, so it was really just the merging of those two groups that created the conservancy. But but then the conservancy sort of steadily worked with all of the different other user groups that had um, an interest in the long term well being of the park. I, uh, oftentimes, when I when I think about conservancies and, and mergers happening. I, I look to um, friends of ours at Belle Isle Conservancy in Detroit, I think is a good example where um, their 
at one time there was four different groups that were nonprofit groups supporting the park. And uh, they, it was, I believe it was back in 2012 where they all joined together to form the one Bell, Bell Isle Conservancy. Yeah. And we have connections at Bell Isle. <laughs> um, Mara, did you want to take Stacey Lamedico's question and then we'll keep going on the. Yeah, um, Stacy had asked um, whether we did not have any kind of formal agreement with the city up until that point uh, in the late 90s when we uh, negotiated the first contract. We had a memorandum of understanding from the very earliest days that you know covered the, the very basic kinds of, of issues, sort of, yes, you exist. Yes, you can be in the park. Yes, you can raise money and spend money. But as our operations became more sophisticated and we were taking over the visitor centers and you know there was retail happening and just the operation became much more sophisticated, we needed a more sophisticated tool. Um, so it wasn't that we didn't have an agreement, it just was a fairly, it was a fairly simple tool. And actually, I, I think most groups now in New York have some version of an MOU versus the contracts, which are much less common as you might imagine, just because most partnerships are not as complex as ours. The, the other, uh, I would say, concurrent point that was also happening at the time of, of the rebuilding of the Great Lawn was the conservancy shifted into a full operation model where we took on park operations. So pr prior to that, as, as the conservancy starting to develop, we had you know a mix of, of volunteer uh, hort crews and then intern crews that removed graffiti and and did selective horticulture work um, and and the whole if you've heard about our, our zone management model uh, which is often talked about this is um, where we have a, a gardener or a groundskeeper in placed in specific locations throughout the park responsible for a multitude of aspects of the landscape, including trash and community engagement and horticulture. That actually began, in, uh, they experimented with that first in 1986 when they opened Strawberry Fields. Uh, that was the Peace Garden to John Lennon um, after he was killed and Yoko Ono donated to the city. Um, where we first placed a gardener in a specific location. Um, and then through that time, uh, it, you know, as, as parks department staff retired or moved to different parks, um, the conservancy would bring on a new staff person. So now um, we are managing park operations for the park. That's kind of a segue to a question from Pete Wheeler, just sort of a balance or an understanding that, you know, there's park maintenance that you guys are in charge of, but are you still undertaking major projects and um, improvements and big capital investments? Yep, we are. We actually, um, I think it was 2019, announced the last major landscape restoration that the Conservancy uh, would be taking on. The last place in the park that we hadn't yet done a major restoration project, and that's the um, uh, up towards the Harlem Mere, the north end of the park, the, the Alaska Rink and Pool is there. Um, and we will be transforming that slowly over the next couple of years into the Harlem um, Outdoor Recreation Center. So that's a huge project, uh, you know, 25 million uh, in donations for the capital work plus a $50 million commitment from the city and a $40 million endowment that we're raising to cycle off the, the operations funds to support it, which is something we, we always do with a capital project at this point um, in our organization's history. And, you know, it's our chief landscape architect likes to say the park is never done. So you're sort of always, <laughs> you're always gonna end up back, you know, uh, fixing the project. And for me, this is one of the interesting tensions of the park is it's this glorious example of 19th century park design smack dab in the middle of a 21st century city. So every time you go back to the drawing board to think about that design, 
what's new, what's different, who's in the park that wasn't in the park before, what are they doing in the park that was different than before? So this sort of constant dialogue of the evolving landscape that's challenging, but, um, but also really exciting. Right. Well, that speaks to the, you know, Balboa Park is for everybody. We are an urban park. We're an asset and the neighborhood park for so many San Diegans that live centrally. Mm -hmm. um, and to that end, I'll just briefly address Janet's question about Balboa Park being viewed as a regional asset and a county asset. And I think that's something that over more time and more, you know, awareness campaigns and kind of advocacy um, that will, will kind of bridge that gap in, um, I don't know that it's a gap in people who don't love the park. It's maybe you know, kind of a gap in, in understanding its needs and it's um, really its economic impact on our region um, is pretty significant. So I think that that comes with that territory of knowing how to use a park and evolve and grow that park to meet the needs of a changing urban um, mm -hmm. community um, yep. to make sure that it's really meaningful and accessible and a place that, that people feel welcome and can find and do the activities that they're seeking. Um, I know if we go to, Stacy has a question in the chat about if issues with people having, um, if there's too much commercialism in the park um, or certain assets and areas that they're allowed to operate, is there a percentage threshold? Um, if you want to address this and that there's like details you want to include in the, in the chat, you're welcome to do that. Do you want to take that one, Chris? I'm sure. happy to as well. Sure, I'll, I'll take that one. So, um, in the park, so things like concessions in the park, everything from the uh, tavern on the green or the boathouse restaurant that you may have heard of, um, or down to like a hot dog vendor outside the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Those that permitting of that is still managed by the City of New York NYC Parks Permit Office. Um, we, as the the day daily kind of steward and operator of the park serve in a, uh, a role as eyes and ears for the agency, but ultimately the agency is still managing, uh, overseeing the bid on, on those concessions. Um, and, and how the, the funding works uh, through our agreement, um, it, there's a, every, every year we have to hit a, a spending threshold as well, a, 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 a fundraising threshold, as well as a capital spending threshold. Once we hit those benchmarks, uh, it, we get 50 cents on the dollar uh, of the concessions. Those go to a general city fund that then go to the parks department and then come back to the conservancy. Um, one challenge that I would say, you know, even right up until the, the pandemic, this, this was something we were about to undertake a comprehensive uh, study on uh, was the, the, this essentially third party underground economy that, that occurs in the park. So everything from pedicabs to expressive matter vendors, artisans that set up in the park, uh, you know, um, or down to um, people that run dog clinics, dog training clinics in the park or camps or sports groups. Um, there, you know, over the last 20 years, there's, there's really been an explosion of that in the park, I would say. Um, and, and we, it, it's something that we are, I think, deeply interested in getting a handle on how much of that money is. Um, being made. Right. I, just, I, yeah, please do. I just had, well, I wanted to add one other element to that. And then um, Ron just asked a, a good question too, that I just lost in the chat, but um, so who, where, and when who determines. Uh, yeah, it's the parks department. Um, we consult, we have a very close consultive relationship with them. I mean, even to the point where we'll sit down with a map of the park and say like, yes, there can be one here. And yes, there can be one here. That's all run. Uh, through the parks department. It's one of um, three main things that the parks department does. The manages that process, they indemnify us, uh, and they are responsible for the uh, enforcement that happens in the park as well. 
But I would just say the other thing is Central Park is a somewhat unique case because it is um, both a, a local and registered landmark and it has a national designation. So that really limits the kind of um, commercial vending opportunities that are possible in the park. So we don't deal with it as much as other parks do necessarily just because the, we, we operate within those parameters as well. But you know, you might see temporary signage with uh, branding if uh, you know it is underwriting a construction site and will only be up for the period of time that the site is being renovated, or if it's funding an event like the Film Fest in the summer, the the sponsor's name would be on the the sort of related collateral for the event. Great, great. Um, Julianne has a great question. What is the biggest challenge to creating a sustainable and productive conservancy that can steward the park's resources effectively? It's like the golden question. I know. I was like, you're asking the wrong person. The biggest challenge. <laughs> one of the biggest challenges. I mean, you've seen a, a number of them, but. Yeah. Um, can you read the question again? I just want to make sure. sure. I... What is the biggest challenge to creating a sustainable and productive conservancy that can steward the park's resources effectively? I, I'm going to sound a bit like a broken record here, but I think a lot of it really does come back to the trust and the relationships that you have to steward along the way. And it's a, the constant maintenance of your relationship with your public partner, the constant maintenance of your relationship with your donor community and your other constituents, and the constant maintenance of your relationship with park users. And you can't really ever stop that work. Um, but, I, you know, I, I think one of the reasons we've been successful, um, you know, a huge part of why we've been successful is because we are very benefit from a fabulous location right in the middle of Manhattan. Um, but we also work very hard to, to build that trust and maintain those relationships. Um, I, I think that's at least one one critical piece. Yeah, well, that made a, might also address John's question. Um, is there a common mistake that you've seen conservancies or other similar entities make that prevent them being as effective as possible in their, in their role? Rushing into it. Rushing into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's sort of the common, if, if I had to, do you agree, Chris? Does that sound? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, we've had, a, we have a lot of groups come and some of them are more established and they're fine tuning a model or there's like a specific thing they want to do. And a lot of groups come because they just want to get going. Sometimes they're re you know, the, the seed for the start of any partnership is often a frustration with who you will eventually be at the table partnering with. And sometimes people just are, they're so frustrated and they just want to get going and they don't take the time to build the relationships and build the trust and create a shared understanding of the best possible way to start. And it just, it burns bridges and that's it. Yeah, that's great insight. Let's right. end with, um, there's one last question I want to end with from Gonzalo. This says, to what extent have you built a focus on diversity and broad representation into your work, in your organizational makeup and in your program? That is also a very good question. Um, I mean, I can speak to some of the stuff that's happening at the organizational level. Um, and, you know, Chris, you, you want to talk about the, the institute piece? Mm -hmm. I, sure. You know, I, I think like most organizations this last year has made us uh, deeply and profoundly aware of the importance of engaging in a meaningful way around issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we're, we're really just you know, we're starting to push through that work now that's included, um, you know, looking at the board composition and being much more focused on um, engaging um, more diverse members, especially members that better represent the communities that surround the park, which we have, you know, it's not something that's, um, we've always been able to achieve in our history and are really focused on doing that now. We, we now have a, a committee of our board that's focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion issues within the organization. Uh, we're slowly starting to build out a platform um, for different ways that we can create safe spaces for our, our staff to start to talk about those issues. Um, and those conversations are gonna feed into sort of a, a more detailed plan that will probably get released sometime toward the end of this year 
going back to the part about who runs the concessions and you know the the piece of what happens in the park you know there's some piece of our work that we're able to be um thoughtful about representation in terms of the vendors that we work with but also some things that are outside of our control so there's always that that balance um so this sort of some of the preliminary things that that we've been doing over this over this last year thanks for that Lauren. yeah, yeah and then on the institute chris do you want to speak to that i'm happy to as well yeah why don't why don't you i'm gonna take one in the chat here okay great tag team in. um the institute's programs you know it's it I'm not speaking out of turn when I say the, the, the communities that are often able to create public private park partnerships are those that are just have more economic resources, which often leaves the communities without those resources, without the ability to start partnerships and in some cases, you know, with with inferior park services. So we are trying very, very hard to invest in the capacity of our own New York City Park Agency as well, so that you know, we are um, helping the agency to um, bring a, oh, sorry, dinner just landed on the floor. No, it's okay. Uh, it's okay. A uh, higher level of service to, to, to um, communities that have been historically underserved. So we have a crew called the Five Borough Crew. They work exclusively outside of Central Park. It, yeah, it's great my child everyone um exclusively in parks throughout the five boroughs that are that um, have been historically underserved as i said and then we really use that lens especially in the partnership lab so you know one of the things that successful applicants need to demonstrate is that they do serve diverse populations and communities of need um, so both through the organizations that we choose to work with in our programs like the partnership lab and then some really on the ground work that we do in New York City through our New York City program and the five borough program. Um, we've been we've been working to to address those issues. Super. Gonzalo, thank you for that question. I feel like that's a great um, topic for us to end this chat on. And Mara and Chris, I'm so grateful to you for coming out to join us on your Tuesday evening, three hours ahead of us. Um, and to all of you that participated in this panel, the questions were super insightful. Um, I'm so glad we had an opportunity to answer. I think we got through all of them. If you do have additional questions that kind of sit with you after having listened, just send them our way. Um, we want to share the information that we've learned with Central Park Conservancy um, and share it with all of you so you can be as informed, um, hopefully, as we are. And I just appreciate the ability to continue to do these virtual events and um, invite as many of our friends to attend and then also have special guests like you. So can't wait to do some more work with you and you know work on these recommendations um, as we transform our organization. So thank you both for being here tonight and thank you everyone for being here. Stay tuned for the March edition of Parkside Chats. Have a good night. Thank you so much. Nice to thank see you all. Thank you, Sarah. Well. <laughs>